According to Forbes magazine, over 80% of all millionaires in the United States of America today are all self made. In other words, they didn't come from a trust fund. They didn't come from a wealthy family. They didn't come from some form of inheritance. They came here and started from this thing called scratch. So how do these millionaires become millionaires if they had nothing? Start from scratch. Well, in this episode, I'm gonna discuss something called character and what it says in the book of Proverbs. Yes, in the good book about how to handle wealth, success, prosperity, happiness. In this episode of the Seven Fear Squad on the Wealth and Wisdom series starting in three, two, one. Let's go. What's cracking, everybody? My new smart guy, Matt Zapala here, hailing to you from Dallas, Texas. And if you feel that our videos have helped you out somehow, some way, please consider hitting like on this video. If you watch a couple of our videos and uh, you're watching another one, please consider hitting subscribe and hit notifications to be alerted the next time you upload our next episode. So let's get into it. In this episode, Proverbs chapter 17, episode 17 of the Wealth and Wisdom series, we're gonna be discussing Proverbs, a book of the Bible that is written by the wisest and richest king who ever lived named King Solomon. In the neighborhood I grew up in, going to church, being the only Filipino kid in an Italian, African-American, Latino neighborhood, the only time I was around other Filipinos was church on Sunday. And we go to church on Sunday and they're kind of like, okay, meet the other Filipino kids, meet the other Filipino parents, kind of cool, awesome, but the Bible didn't really sit inside me as a life manual on how to run your life until I had my own kids, until I got my own marriage and divorce, until I started running a business, until I started handling money. And I realized when I cracked open the Bible, just kind of flipping around and just kind of curious what I had to say, I realized that Proverbs has some pretty awesome things to say about money. And I consider the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes book the original OG mean tweets of how to handle a tough situation in your life. And so I want to realize that when people are elevating financially, there's a certain level of not only investments, but more and so characters and mindset and attitude. So in this episode, as we're unpacking an episode every week for the next 31 weeks, and now we're in our 17th week, we're going to break down this week, Proverbs chapter 17. And this is King Solomon's sayings. He's talking to his kids. He has some words of wisdom. And uh, I'm using as a reference uh, Bible, the John Maxwell Leadership Bible. And John Maxwell is, in my opinion, one of the foremost experts, number one on the list for leadership and leadership development. And when he writes this Bible, he's got his perspective in these books. And I want to take an excerpt from his talk here on leadership and the position of credibility and empowerment. So he talks about, according to him, leadership is not about position. It's about empowerment. Chapter 17, verse 2, it reads like this. A prudent servant will rule over a disgraceful son and will share the inheritance as one of the family. Now, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty big thing. In other words, even if that son or that daughter was disgraceful to their parents, but a servant or somebody in the household who was there to help and serve that family was more honorable and more credible and more helpful and was contributing to the household versus just taking. In other words, what King Solomon said, who's about to have a mass amount of inheritance going from one generation to another, he said, listen, hey son, hey daughter, if you don't want to honor me, you honor our family, you want to be just disgraceful to our family, you want to take away from the family versus add to the family name, guess who's going to get the inheritance? Guess who's going to get the money? Guess who's going to get my namesake? Our servant. Because leadership is influence. Nothing more, nothing less, according to John Maxwell. Leadership is not about position, it's about production. You can be in a title, you can have the, a rich family last name, you can have the title of boss, you can have the title of sergeant, you have the title of CEO, but unless you're helping people become more productive in their life, you're not a leader. You just have the title of one. He also talks about, their, about education. It's not about education that's gonna help you. It's not about reading the books and quoting scripture like a lot of people like to do and remind me on, on this channel that it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than a rich man to get into heaven without really understanding the context of what the eye of the needle is. But again, that's another video. But it's not about the education. It's not about judging other people. It's about application. It's about applications and making a difference in other people's lives for the better. So John Maxwell talks about credibility being when our life matches our talk. When we're walking the walk, we're just not talking to talk and you have examples of success. You have the fruit of your labor because what do you want to be? You want to be a wise slave or do you want to be a foolish son? According to King Solomon, it's better to be a wise slave than to be a foolish son. So he talks about the five C's here. Let's go over these real quick. Five C's to ask yourself. Consistency. Are you the same with me than with other people? Are you the same at your house? Are you the same person at your work? Are you the same person at your church? Are you the same person at your gym? Or do you think you gotta shift character? That you gotta be different things around these group of friends, 
friends from your house, from growing up, friends from your office, friends from your sorority, your fraternity, friends from the military. You got to be different around other people. That's called consistency. Co choices. Are you making decisions based on benefits to you or to others? Well, man, I got to do what's best for my family. I got to do what's best for my family. Yes, but if you are a leader, you just don't account in totality what's best for your family. If you are a leader, if you are somebody that's planning the future growth of your business, your finances, are you thinking about others or only for yourself? Number three, credit. Are you quick to recognize others for their efforts in your success? Oftentimes leaders and people that are succeeding financially say, hey, I did this, I did this, I did this, without saying, but the team behind me helped me do it. Because you might be self-made, but more importantly, for a lot of people's self-success, it's actually teammate because there's people around you. And for those of you watching this channel, it's not just self-made, it's not only teammate, but more so, it's faith made. Next one, character. Are you working hard on the image, what you look like, or are you really working on your integrity? If I looked at you as an influencer online, a guru here online, or somebody that has some form of capacity to lead people, but I see you behind the scenes, offline, off camera, behind the stages, who are you really? Are you just a person that's good online or on stage? when the camera's on and everybody's watching or behind closed doors, when the cameras are off and nobody's watching, do you operate with integrity in the decisions that you make? What about credibility? Have you recognized that credibility is a victory? It's a victory. It's something that you can lose or something that can win. It's just not a gift. Oh, thank you for my credibility. Oh, thank you for, no, no, no. Credibility is something that you earn. For example, credibility is something earned with the banks. It's called your credit score. Credibility is how you show the banks that you pay your bills on time. I often say that your credit score is a reflection of your attitude. Your bank account is a reflection of your consciousness and what you're aware of. So let's look into some of these things in terms of dealing with family and friends and some characteristics. Because as you journey on in here in chapter 17, King Solomon talks about family and friends a lot. And he talks about your attitude a lot. There's a bunch of other things here and I want to encourage you, do not do not wait for me to read the Bible for you. I encourage you to look at the Bible yourself and read chapter 17 and read it for yourself and I'm just giving you the highlights but consider reading it by yourself don't depend on me a pastor a teacher anybody that you have in terms of any subject whether it be the Bible whether it be values and principles whether it be the subject you're learning at your school at your job just don't rely on the person teaching you the subject for them to tell you what to think you should take this video and say you know what man I agree with you on this subject but I disagree with you on this subject um, yeah man I don't think I agree with that perspective I think I'm reading it in a different perspective if that's the case put it in the comment section well, I love knowing your thoughts I'm, I'm not the end all be all I'm not a pastor I'm not a preacher I don't have a college degree I don't have a master's in divinity or anything like that I'm just an entrepreneur just trying to live my life the best I can with the values and principles that's tested and that have stood the test of humankind. And so what does King Solomon say here about dealing with family and friends? Let's read Proverbs chapter 17, verse 6. It reads like this. Children's children are a crown to the aged, and parents are a pride of their children. Listen, I grew up in a household where, man, you're judged by how your kids turn out. It's like, what? Are you kidding me? After having five kids, I've learned that's a very tough thing to do because I can control me and I can equip my children with values and principles, but yet at the end of the day, it's their life. I just happen to be a steward over my children. I mean, God entrusted the children to be under my care. And then as they become adults, as they become their own citizens, having their own relationship with the, as a child of God to their spiritual father, I just have to be their earthly father, that they have to choose, okay, is my family of origin also my family of choice and oftentimes many people think that their children they're gonna be judged by how their children turn out what a rough thing to deal with but according to King Solomon here says the grandkids are a crown to the grandparents or the great-grandparents but yet the parents are crowned to the children not the other way around so in other words children can say yeah it's my mom and dad crown yeah that's my it's my grandparents' crown. In other words, the, the kids here, the way I'm reading this, and correct me if I'm wrong, it says parents are the pride of their children. Interesting there. So for those of you thinking that you are judged by how your children turn out, consider reading the scripture and let me know what you think in the comment section below. Number two, foster love and forgiveness. Chapter 17, verse 9, it reads like this. Whoever would foster love covers an offense, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. 
just yesterday on a conference call. I was steamed. And I said something that was offensive to a friend of mine, a business partner. And he sends me this long text. I realized I offended him. I realized that I challenged his character. I was wrong. I said, you know what? I'd rather call you instead of texting you. And I don't want the day to go by without us quashing this issue. So he called me back later at night. I think it was like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock that night after me reading his message all day, getting up my appointments. We had a conversation and we quashed it. I said, brother, listen, at the end of the day, I love you and what you stand for and the, and the, the values and principles that you stand on and where you and your family are growing and going. And I hope for the long term, you and I get to rock out and do business together for a very long time. That our children get to hang out together. We, they take on this business from us at one day, at one point. And I suspect, my friend, my partner, that this is not the first nor the last time we're going to have conflict. But I want you to know, in love and in grace, I apologize if I offended you, if I challenged your character in front of other people, I was wrong. Can we move forward? We accept my apology. No problem, man. We, we move on. So, why? Because we're looking to foster love and forgiveness. Not I'm right and you're wrong which oftentimes is the conversation. Starting a fight. What does King Solomon say here about you being a person that starts a fight? Well, let's look at chapters 17, verse 14 and 19. It reads like this. Starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam. So stop the matter before a dispute breaks out. Let's go to 19. Whoever loves a quarrel loves sin. Whoever builds a high gate invites destruction. And these are for people that say, I'm building a high gate because I don't trust you. I don't trust a lot of people. I don't trust a lot of people. We're inviting a lot of people to say, okay, if you don't trust me, I'm going to start a fight with you. I'm going to start a war with you. Or what about the people that all they want to do is pick a fight and people that want to troll. And the crazy thing about this day and age, trolls win. Isn't that crazy? Trolls win these days. But I don't know how long that's going to last. So you can win today initially, but according to, to scripture here, according to values and prison, I'm pretty sure back in the day there were people there getting rich quick also. But I wonder how long that wealth lasted, um, especially when you want to start a fight with everybody. Uh, who shows up in adversity? Proverbs chapter 17, verse 17, it reads like this. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. You know, oftentimes I find myself in a fight, whether a physical fight or a mental fight or an argument in a boardroom or argument between two companies or competition, etc., etc. And the people that I thought would show up never said anything or showed up or never found them in the field of battle. The people I, I least thought that would show up, showed up. And I realized at that point who my friends were. And I realized who I thought my friends were. If that's you, you wanna be that type of friend to other people, put in the comment section below this affirmation. I am a friend that shows up in adversity. I am a friend that shows up in adversity. Put in the comment section below. So let's move on to what a foolish child is to a parent. A foolish child is to a parent, Proverbs chapter 17, verse 21 and 25. It reads like this, 21, to have a fool for a child brings grief. There is no joy for the parent of a godless fool. Let's go to 25. A foolish son brings grief to his father and bitterness to the mother who bore him. Now, I hope that many of you parents don't take these two scriptures and show your kid, ah, you're a fool. And if you're a fool, ah, not, not, you know, you're using scripture to judge your kids. But I actually ask this for myself. Am I a fool to my own parents? Have I not honored my parents? Am I an idiot to the people that I say I love and care about that brought me into this world that try to do their best to provide for me when I couldn't provide for myself, to feed me when I couldn't feed myself? Am I honoring them or are I disgracing them? If I'm not honoring them or if I am disgracing them, guess what? I am a fool to them. So I'm not using these two scriptures not as a way for parents to judge their kids or try to get their kids to come in alignment. I'm using this as myself, as a mirror to reflect that what my relationship is to the people I love and care about and I, who I honor, who I have, is even though, even though I didn't agree with them growing up. For example, my wife laughs because the quietest room you'll find me is in the same room with my dad. We just don't talk. But that doesn't mean it's right. It's just been awkward for me to talk to my dad. He's been present in my life and very awkward for me to bring things up and I'm working on that, I'm pushing through that. So it was a take your daddy to work day the other week. And I decided to take my dad to my office to take him around the things that I, I get excited about and uh, things that uh, we connected with when I was growing up. And we rekindled our relationship and we're talking to our relationship. And even though my, da my dad doesn't have the same coherence and ability to talk today as he was back maybe 5, 10, 15 years ago, doesn't mean we can't heal that relationship today because I want to make sure I'm not a foolish child to my dad. 
And one thing he's never said to me is, I love you. But guess what I say to him all the time when I see him? I love you, I love you, I love you, even though he doesn't say it to me because I don't want to be a fool to my father. So let's move to attitude. What does King Solomon say about attitude? You'll be tested like precious metals. You'll be tested like silver. You'll be tested like gold. Chapter 17, verse 3, it reads like this. The crucible for silver and a furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. No, he doesn't test the body. No, he doesn't test the brain. The Lord tests your heart. Because Paul uh, discusses in, in the New Testament, the, the heart is also very filthy. It's a very filthy type of thing. So, so guess what? God is always trying to test. He's trying to test our heart. So you'll be tested all the time to be refined. Because that's what you do with silver and gold. You refine it to become pure. And that's what God wants to do in your heart. That's what King Solomon says. Hey, God wants to test it so I can be more pure in my delivery, my contribution. My elevation and success, what happens when I get power, when it happens when I get money, I'm going to be non-refined and next thing you know I'm corrupted. I got things that don't make me more refined or things that corrupt me. Because if you want to test somebody, here's how you test somebody. Not only give them money, but give them power and see what they do with the both. If you feel that you're being refined in your finances, your mindset, your attitude, put it in the comment section below. I am being refined like precious metals. I am being refined like precious metals. Put it in the comment section below. Number two, treating others when they do good. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 13 reads like this. Evil will never leave the house of one who pays back evil for good. So if somebody's trying to do something good for you and you return it with evil, guess what? You're going to have a bad life. Some people call that karma. We call that chapter 17, verse 13 in Proverbs. Fools with money versus access to wisdom. Hmm, it's an interesting uh, a statement there. What does it say here in chapter 17, verse 16? It reads like this. Why should fools have money in hand to buy wisdom when they are not able to understand it? So if you ever wonder why you don't have money, ask yourself, hey Lord, am I a fool? Have I acted ridiculous with money? Is that the reason why blessings aren't coming my way? Because I don't know what to do. Because you know I don't know what to do when I get this money. Because guess what has happened the last couple years? in our economy, in our country, in the United States of America throughout this pandemic. Some form of universal basic income has been paid to America through unemployment checks, through stimulus checks, through child tax credits. And what has happened to that money? Where did it go? It went to the business owners. It went to the people that built something to attract money to it because they're providing value to the community based on products and services to attempt helping other people have a better life or to help people improve. They're like, those are the entrepreneurs, those are the creators, those are the capitalists, the right type of capitalists. But if you're a fool with money, you just blew it, and you're sitting home playing video games, and you're not improving your skill set, and you're sleeping in, and this and this and that, and buying into a lazier standard versus a higher standard to inspire greater work and standards and efforts on your behalf. What are you doing with money when you get it? What are you doing right now in evenings and weekends? What are you doing with it? And you wonder why opportunities and money don't come away. Something to think about, something I thought about when I was broke in many different situations. Hey, Gord. I said, hey, God, what am I doing with money? Am I, doing, am I being smart? Am I being money smart with finances? No? Okay, what do I need to change? And that was my prayer. Lord, don't take off this pressure, but instead, send me the people I need to see and allow me to give them, get the wisdom to ask the questions I need to ask. Next one, chill for heart and a crushed spirit. What does that mean? Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22, it reads like this. A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up bones. Listen, I've been broke many times in my life, but one thing I always wanted to guard now, I encourage you to do this too as well. I've been broke many, many, many times, but one thing I did not allow myself to come to is to be in a position of being discouraged. In other words, I'm without courage. In other words, my spirit is crushed because I want to get out of the situation, but if my spirit is crushed, I didn't let anybody want to crush my spirit competition, a hater, a troll. I don't want them to crush my spirit. You can, be, you can defeat me. You can have your short-term wins, no problem. But long-term, because you don't crush my spirit, I'm going to outwork you. I'm going to improve you. I'm going to out-strategize you. And I'm going to outlast you. Last but not least, it talks about fools who are silent. So if you're a fool, you keep quiet, what happens to you? How are you deemed? According to King Solomon, chapter 17, verse 28, it reads like this. Even fools are thought wise if they keep silent, even discerning if they hold their tongues. And I'm wondering too as well, does King Solomon, does God look at a fool one day and finally turn a fool into a wise person? I wonder because it kind of happened to me. 
It kind of happened to the people I do business with. It kind of happened to the people that we're helping in the marketplace. It kind of happened to the people that uh, we see in conferences all across the country. If you're a fool today and you start holding back your words and start asking questions, even a fool can transition potentially into somebody that's considered wise. So when I'm looking at this, how? What's the process? As I'm journeying down my life, I'm looking to make money, looking to provide for my family, looking to improve my life. I hope that you surround with somebody with somebody that increases your foresight, the vision that you have for your life. At the same time, too, you have to look at yourself in introspectively inside. Here you have a coach, somebody guiding you along the way. Here, hindsight, right? What you did better. And keep away from the trolls, keep away from the doubters, right? Keep away from the people that keep you where you used to be. But hindsight, the only reason why you look back is to reference what you want to experience ever again. And at the same time, when you look back, you tell yourself, you know what? I learned from those mistakes. And I thank God as I'm looking back to the front, I'm thankful for how far the good Lord has allowed me to come. So that being said, guys, let me know your thoughts, your questions, your feedback. You agree with me, you don't agree with me, put in the comment section below. Uh, I'm very excited about this whole entire talk about progress because if there's certain values and principles that stood the test of time during good times and bad times of our humankind, of human history, I want to make sure I don't follow the standard of me just being a good person, but I want to follow a standard of something that's considered wise and something that's considered time tested. So before I let you go, if you haven't watched these two other episodes here, please consider watching the other episodes here of the Wealth and Wisdom series. If you're watching this video and you felt that it provided value to you, I'd love to see you hit that like button. If you haven't done so already, you watch a couple of these and it has provided value to you and you do like it, please consider hitting subscribe and hitting notifications to be alerted the next time we upload our next episode. From Dallas, Texas, I'm your Mighty Smart Guy and until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart and be Mighty Smart today. See you next week.